estimate using the plate load. We're going to finish that today, all right? The plate loading test, and then that's the other one, the other method, and then we'll just move on on uh, uh, closing up the settlement. Then hopefully at some point in time, if I don't, if you don't work uh, during this presentation, I'll just uh, send it to Shakila. I'm not even sure if Shakila is here now, you know? <laughs> anyway, moving on. So the, if you recall, again, you know, while I'm doing this, uh, there are sometimes, I mean, sometimes I will not bother to, uh, to remind you that you need to uh, recall some of those, uh, recall the notes on site investigation. If you, for some reason or another, right, have forgotten uh, about the site investigation topic. All right. So again, here, uh, this is the plate bearing test. Yeah, plate bearing test. And you recall from the site investigation a topic, what we do is that we load a steel file. No, sorry, not steel file, steel plate at the, cent at the same level as the anticipated uh, footing or foundation. Right? Suppose you can put some, some, some shallow uh, footing that say 1.5 meter depth, say, right? At 1.5 meter depth. So you then say to yourself, okay, now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take uh, my ground, the same ground, all right? Where my footing is supposed to be to 1.5 meter deep, then I'm just going to put my steel plate. Now that steel plate of some size, which I will uh, mention later, all right? Of some size is going to be loaded, all right? It's going to be loaded with uh, a range of load, right, which would cover the design load that you anticipate. Right? So basically, you're going to get some settlement out of it. Okay? So the size of the uh, plate, all right, a plate, it could be either circular or could be could be a circle, circular in shape or, 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 or square in shape. So the size usually is 0.3 to 1 meter square or circular, all right? We give them a circular, circular shape, right? If you have 0.3 meter or let me just use 1 meter, which is easier for me. 1 meter, 1 meter, right? And then that would be 1 meter squared. And if you're going to have a circle, you just say pi r squared or pi d squared over 4 is equal to 1 meter squared. And you find the equivalent diameter, all right? Now... Uh, what else is there to be said? Okay, now you recall from the SPT test, right? The standard penetration test. This idea that that uh, was that was introduced to you that if you limit the settlement by say twenty five millimeter in the SPT case is twenty five millimeter maximum settlement, so you then find the equivalent bearing capacity. All right, so. Instead of trying to find the settlement, right, you load it and you say, you say the odometer test where you calculate things. You say to yourself, I'm going to do the calculation, give me all the parameters and what, you know, if the load is this amount, what is the settlement? You now say to yourself, well, what the heck, I'm not going to go through that. I'm going to say to myself, I'm going to limit it to 25 millimeter, which is one inch, and then I'm going to use a chart or which is the equivalent. Uh, which will give me the equivalent bearing uh, bearing capacity, right? And that is the allowable bearing capacity. So as long as my allow my load, all right, and thus therefore my bearing capacity, the load that is given to the soil is not more than my allowable bearing capacity. So my settlement will never be more than twenty five millimeter. All right. Okay. So now. Uh, guys, I'm still not happy with this 50, 50 attended. So there's something wrong, but I am missing eight people. So I'll have to find out who are the missing person at some point in time. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, that idea, all right, that idea is being stated is, is the same idea is being carried out here. Okay. So you see the purpose of the test is to determine the allowable bearing capacity based on settlement characteristic. All right. Since you've done your first test, you have a rough idea of what this is about. Anyway, I haven't finished grading your first test. It's very difficult for me to uh, read stuff on the computer. Right. Just to remind you on that. Anyway, I'll get around to it. 
the other thing is that you assume that the soil, all right, that when you load this, is going to be the same uniform type of soil, all right, and it is not a uh, you know different type of soil. So it is homogeneous uh, sand, all right, or, or any combination of uh, sand sand soil, all right, and um, thick stratum, right, not thin. Uh, this these two criteria is important for you to note because uh, we will see the limitation of these uh, equations. So you see that uh, Tazagi and Peck will suggest to you use this formula, which is equation 14.16. Rho over rho 1 is equal to 4 over 1 plus B1 over B, and you square the thing. All right? So B rho is the settlement for footing of width B, and row one is the settlement of uh, of a footing of width B one. So let's just see that in the example below how we use that equation. Now again, this is the the caution here that the results of tests are sensitive to any small variation. Uh, when the measurement of settlement is made, you need to be extra careful when the plate is being placed on the soil. Otherwise, errors are introduced. Now, if you recall. Yeah, just to remind you, because on the assumption that you have your site investigation notes here, right? You have a plate, and you put your your dial gauge here, another dial gauge here. They are diametrically opposite. Okay, diametrically opposite. You can, if you have more money, you put another one here, another one here. So you have all four corners of your steel plate. In this case, this is a rectangle. Usually, we use a square. All right, and then we're going to load it. And then you have a cantilash above it, all right? You have a cantilash, you have a hydraulic jack, and then you have a load. You come with a crane and a one meter cube, concrete cube. You put it on top of the cantilash, all right? And then uh, you keep increasing the load and you can get your load and settlement, yeah? You can get your load, your settlement against time. Uh, you get your load against time, you get your settlement against time, all right? So why am I saying this? I'm talking about all of this. And, and I think in the site investigation, I gave you all the schematics, all right? And I don't want you to get confused, all right, with the pile load test, which I'm going to talk uh, at some point today as well. Now, they basically are the same thing, but the, the one is a plate, the other is a pile, all right? Okay, so... Um, as you load, so obviously this has the assumption here is that when you load the, the, the plate, it will all come uniformly down. All right. That's why you have one here and one at the opposite end, diametrically opposite, because you know uh, the idea is that you know uh, some settlement here, some settlement here, you will divide it by two. Hopefully it averages out things. All right. Now, so you do two plate load tests. That's one, you get the supplement seven millimeter, and the second one here, uh, the second test is nine millimeter. The steel plate is 0.3 millimeter square. All right. The applied load that you apply is 20 kilo newton when you notice this, uh, this, this, this uh, settlement. Okay. Then you need to determine the size of the square fitting if the settlement is limited to a maximum of 25 millimeter. All right. So you now basically are familiar with this idea of. Uh, limiting the settlement to a maximum value of 25 millimeter, all right? Um, so the average settlement on two tests is eight millimeter, putting settlement given is 25 millimeter. This is the actual putting that the settlement that you want, the maximum value of the actual putting is 25 millimeter. So you just prorated it. Oh, I'm already on the next page, yeah? So I'm prorating it, 25 divided by eight, then four is the 4 over 1 plus 0.3 and uh, divide by B squared. So B is now 2.28 millimeter. In other words, I'm saying if my B is 2.3 millimeter, the maximum settlement that will occur to it is 25 millimeter. The test is just a representation of the maximum value that I will get. All right. So in other words, what my plate is behaving is the same as what my putting will behave when ultimately I have my building, yeah? So now I just find the pressure beneath the plate, load divided by the area, so I get 222 uh, kilopascal, 
Now, assuming that the pressure beneath the plate is the same as for the footing, then you multiply that. So I will get the allowable load, the load that will come. Say this is a, a independent footing, right? One footing. So the load that will come from the uh, column is uh, maximum will be 1,155.2 kilonewton. Uh, I think that's about it in terms of the uh, in terms of the plate load test. Is there any question that you like to ask me about that one? You are familiar with it, right? Now, if you are familiar with it, then you must recall that I did mention to you about the fact that you need to have it um, uniform. Now I'm going to show to you again my site investigation note. I hope you have it all uh, beside you. Yeah. Recall this, this picture here. Yes or no? Yeah, you can see me. Right, this is on page fifteen eleven. Figure 15.5. Ayn, are you around? Now I have 53 people. I'm getting happier. All right. <laughs> 53 people minus one is 52. I still have six people missing. Ayn, are you there? I know where. I, I, yes, sir. Okay. I'm on page 1511. Figure 15.5. Are you there? You are my benchmark, say, as uh, Amy said so last week. <laughs> you are on page 15.11 and figure 15.5, right? Figure 15.5 assumes that if you have the load, uh, you apply this load, this is the, the stress. In other words, apply the load for stress, right? And then you have this onion bulb, which is a contour of stresses that are being applied in the soil, right? The one that is shown here has the same value of uh, stresses that are given in the soil. Now, for this soil here, all right, it is within the confines of this uh, layer of, of, of soil, right? Now, if I have another, say, layer here, which is different, the, the, the bottom layer here is different from the top one, it is not uniform. But then I assume, right? The assumption here is that my stresses, my stresses are constant. Oh boy, right? A constant with depth. So this doesn't apply because this is a two different material, and this in this is worse, right? The last one here is worse because it covers three different strata of soil. All right. So I just want to remind you again, right? That. This was pointed out to you previously in site investigation. This is then repeated to you. Right? This was repeated to you when I read this, uh, this, this when I <laughs> when I read this set of notes a few minutes ago um, on page 21, right? Just before the equation. I said to you homogeneous sand or soil and thick stratum or layer. Then and only then can you use that equation. Now, why am I saying this to you? Okay. Now, the thing about your test one of those people I have graded, all right? You know, you write so many things, but you don't tell me why you do it. And you tell me that if you say, for example, you also did the SPT. And then you tell me, I also want the relative density. I want this, I want that. What the heck, you know? <laughs> It's like you didn't know what bearing capacity is all about. But I assume at that point in time, not that I assume, I seem to recall that at that point in time, you had already done bearing capacity. And if it is in clay, you only need C and P. Yes or no? Right? So why do you need all the relative density and everything? If you wanted to know the bearing capacity, but in this particular case, you wanted to know the settlement. So why all these things? Then you said to me, you did the plate bearing test, and then you did uh, this, uh, the depth of the soil. You, did, you wanted to determine it, and, and you use a geophysical method. Fine, you did your geophysical method. I agree with you. And then you said, I still need another hole. But what is the purpose of the hole? And then you said to me that you actually can't get the, uh, you know, through the hole. You have, you have all these rocks and boulders and everything. So I'm like, 
okay so you know i'm getting confused when i write you uh, when i read your 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 answers it's like you don't know what you're doing so when you copy and paste then it becomes a problem all right unless i don't read them right unless i just like do a generalization so there is a possibility that i may ask you to do some of those questions in 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 15 you know in, in chapter 15 again as part of test two all right the, uh, you did on 15.1 so it could be that i ask you to do a 15.2a as part of the uh, test two all right you better be clear and this time i'm going to limit the <laughs> The, the answer script to only two pages all right all i want to know is what are you going to do why you do it and you know <laughs> if you don't need it why do you tell me so all right so i've been telling you many things all right but uh, you don't seem to get it into your head and also my i i, I specifically said in test one i said if you cite it put it in the reference list. In other words, if you don't cite it, don't put it in the reference list. But I still get that. So I mark all these things down. All right? Instead of you getting higher marks, you get lower mark because you don't seem to get what I am saying. All right? That's my worry now. All right? This isn't a copy and paste uh, class. I do expect you to actually pay some attention to some of the things that is expected of you. I'm not being any harder than normal, all right? So you should pay attention to all of those things. You now understand why I do certain things. Yes or no? Mohan says yes. Okay. <laughs> all right. Now, but... You know, it's highly unlikely you, you fail your test one, all right? It's just that, you know, <laughs> there I was trying to give you higher marks, but you decide to actually have lower marks for yourself. So this is why I'm like, oh, well, you know, maybe I shouldn't like spend too much time on it. Okay? So now I'm done. I'm done with the clays. I'm done with the sandy soil, all right? You now know. Uh, how to calculate bearing capacity and how to calculate settlement all right for a shallow footing you now should know why you need certain data from site investigation if there is no need for it you don't bother all right you know what you need okay all right so uh since we are talking about settlement we know how to calculate settlement whether in clay or in sand now the question is what is the allowable settlement right if we have bearing capacity we have allowable bearing capacity now settlement same story we have allowable settlement so uh, what is more important than the maximum settlement all this while i'm talking to you right whether you're doing plate bearing tests or you are doing uh, spt tests or you're doing cpt tests in sand or you're doing the odometer test or this captain and barum prediction they are all maximum settlement all right maximum settlement that will occur when you load uh, your shallow footing now that is not so uh, critical what is more critical is the differential settlement yeah differential settlement for example now this is my rough footing right rough footing and here i'm able to find the settlement here at this corner and let's say i can find another settlement the settlement at this corner and because it is not a uniform soil right it is uh if this part here is more compressible all right then this part here you know by now that when you did your site investigation all right when you do your site investigation part of the soil is not uh not necessarily all uniform right you can have a, a more compressible layer uh, some you know some distance away so if this is more compressible and i load it here all right i load it here and and and, and i i only said to you this is a rough footing let, uh, let me say let me correct that i have another footing here another footing here another footing here another footing right so it's not rough footing 
is all shallow putting and they're all independent of each other because this is more compressible. I load it here. So I'm going to have more maximum settlement down there than I'm going to have it here because this is less settlement. So this is differential settlement. All right. Okay. Now, just to give you an idea and a picture. All right. So this occurs, say, in that clock tower in Tulu Intan, or if you are more familiar with the Tower of Pisa, the Tower of Pisa is in Italy, in the town of Pisa. All right. Um, okay. Um, let's have a look at that picture of um, that appears in figure 14.15 on page 14.34. All right. Oh. I'm on page 14.34. Yeah. All right. So if I have that picture besides me, see the thing is that my my original sets of notes has been taken away, and instead someone else has given not this not this cohort. Someone else has given me their set of notes, and 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 they have. What do they call it? And they have jumbled up, right? The set of notes. So some of those things that are supposed to be in this part of the set of notes is now in the part of the pile foundation. So I'm like, mm, what a waste of time. Anyway, I refer to my original set of notes on figure 14.34. And then let's just now have a look at that uh, quickly, the definition, all right? So, Row max is the maximum settlement in for any portion of the foundation. So I can see that on figure 14.15. The definition of settlement, I have the original foundation level. And then I have one uh, one footing, one footing. The, it has like the settlement, right? You have to imagine that, that from the original foundation level, the footing has gone down, down, right? Has subsided. Uh, by an amount called row max. Can you see that? Yes. This is the amount row max. Uh, yeah. Let's go on down from the original foundation. This uh, original foundation level to parts here. Okay. This is not the original uh, surface level. This is the foundation level. Let's go on down. Subsidence. All right. Okay. So that's the maximum settlement. Now, if you see that, the second part is says delta, which is the maximum differential settlement between any two portions of the foundation. So you see there is delta there, right? So and between, delta is between the the, the, the well, I have to show it to you, right? So delta is 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 between this this putting here. There is delta. That's delta. So there is this putting here, which has gone down by this much. Right, and then there is this one which has gone down by that much. So delta is just the difference between uh, this putting and this putting. Right, the maximum, the two two maximum settlements that occur under each putting, and then the difference between the two maximum settlement is delta. So then that's the maximum differential settlement between any two portions of the foundation. Okay. All right. Then we have this delta O L, which is the maximum maximum angular distortion of buildings with columns, where delta is the differential settlement between the adjacent column uh, footing and L is the column spacing. So L is there, right in between, and then there is that delta. Delta is between adjacent, uh, the difference between the settlement between adjacent column. Then that delta divided by L is the angular distortion. And then uh, finally, four is the rel relative deflection, which is the ratio of the maximum settlement to the length of the structure. So you just find the maximum settlement, okay, and then you divide by the rank length of the structure, okay. So you have all those definitions of of settlement. The only thing you learn in in this course thus far is the theory of maximum settlement, which is like number one on page 24 all the others you don't learn about the theories okay now the way we go about in this class is that we say to ourselves okay if i know what, how to calculate the maximum settlement all right uh, the ones that are being being taught to you anyway okay 
I'm good. Then, then what we're going to do is that we're going to like, uh, we're going to just use a chart. Okay, no need to learn from the theory. Maybe in in years to come, or maybe perhaps if you work in a consultant firm, in years to come, they will teach you more than. Okay, so for the moment to get you started, this is how you're going to address the issue. All right. So you know how to calculate the maximum settlement, and then what you're going to do is that you're going to use uh, figure. 14.16 and figure 14.17 figure 14.16 and figure 14.17 i'm assuming you have it in your in your next few pages all right i have seem to have them here in the next few pages so if i were to look at figure 14.16 all right on the horizontal axis is the maximum settlement all right and the, the, on the vertical axis is the maximum differential settlement. Now, I know from all the theories that I've been learning, whether odometer method, whether white scanter bearing method, whether I use SPT or CPT or plate bearing, all right? Or, in fact, I, if I were to find it experimentally using the LAM and pull loss method or the stress path method, all right? So, I know how to get the maximum settlement. On the horizontal axis and then you know i i could have my structures my buildings whether they are uh, on clay or on sand all right on clay or on sand so my my uh, my structure on on clay could be rigid or could be flexible all right could be rigid or could be flexible so that is being explained to you in uh, soil mechanics too so I just go through that chart and then I get my differential settlement. So my problem is solved, right? Now, if I go to the next chart, now I have my differential settlement. And then the next chart will, will, will give me the, 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 the differential settlement against the angular distortion. So I have my differential settlement from the earlier chart. And then I go into this uh, other chart, which gives you buildings on sand or buildings on clay, and it will give me the maximum angular distortion. All right. So now you know basically th that there is this this uh, chart uh, uh, for you to get your uh, differential settlement and your angular distortion, having known what the definition is. Now. The idea then is, is to say to yourself, what are the maximum values that a building right, can, can, uh, can endure if you have all these uh, settlement uh, values? In other words, if I know how to calculate and I, if I can get the you know, maximum settlement, the angular distortion differential settlement, how do I know what my building uh, can, can sustain? So that, that table, all right? The table on uh, table 14.6, table 14.7, and table 14.8 is, is an indication of what is possible. Of course, with respect to, to the British standards, or now if you use the Euro code, they may have uh, updated the, the, the values. All right, but in terms of uh, in terms of uh, of an indication of what they are. You can perhaps see on page, uh, on page, uh, what is it? I don't know. See, I have the, Oof. okay, table 14.6 uh, is on figure, it's on page 14.35, yeah? So, what? On page 14.35, you see the maximum allowable settlement for buildings and load bearing walls. You have footings and rough, then you have maximum settlement, and then you have different maximum differential settlement. This is according to Scampton and McDonald in 1956. All right, the footing is uh, on clay is given right up to 75, and on sand is 50 maximum settlement. If if you have a rough, it's anywhere between 75 to 125. 50 to 75. Now, this gives you an indication of you know the maximum settlement values that you that will not 
that will not cause any problem to your building. But mostly, we generally don't try to go that far. Okay, usually we kind of limit it to 25 millimeter because we are well, we are we are worried. We, we are scared, right? That things might not become uh, what we anticipate them to be. All right. So just to give you an indication on table 14.6, of course, uh, hopefully, with you know, as you go into design, you will see all this, uh, all this uh, suggestions and recommendation according to the codes and according to the standards. Now, uh, the bottom part of that page 14.35, table 14.6 gives you the uh, every settlement for more more detailed indication if you have say plain brick walls and then you have uh, you know you use brick and then you reinforce it with concrete or reinforce brick or you can have plain frame building or you have this ultimately solid reinforced concrete foundation you have to see 300 millimeter uh, average settlement maximum all right uh, these are usually uh, very heavy structure that's why you see the settlement is much much higher yeah okay uh mira testing hello line saya throat sir sorry kalau terlalu terlef banyak kali oh okay uh, yeah 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 where does where does mira come from by the way i forgotten now I have 54 people. That is getting better now, I hope. Uh, I have 58 minus 54, 58 minus uh, 53. So five people are missing. Uh, and then table 14.7 gives you the limits of angular distortion of building. That's on uh, page 14.36, right? On page 14.36, the limits of angular distortion. Uh, the the other one is on page 14.39 uh, table 14.8 is the maximum allowable angular distortion of building and load bearing walls all these tables table 14.6 table 14.7 and uh, table 14.8 are just tables for design all right um, highly unlikely that I that I will be testing them. Uh, I'll be testing you on that. So, but just to give you an, an indication of the kind of things that you need to be uh, aware of when you are designing for all your structure. So, in table 14.7, you can see that structure damage to the building, angular distortion, maximum of 1 over 150. Okay? All right. So, basically, guys, I am done with settlement is there any question you want to ask me about settlement i'll give you the homework later on uh, say uh, after this all right you, you're gonna have a lot of homework you realize that yes hello i asked a question earlier on do you know where Mila, mira is where mira is located nobody knows Nobody cares about him. Or oh, all of you are asleep. You set your alarm. <laughs> you set Azik Azha. I think Sabak Bernam. Nadia says Kuala Selangor. Good. See how well you know your friends. Anissa Sungai Besar. Rohi Matut Toyiba. Kuala Selangor. I thought she said, she mentioned to me something about Kuala Selangor. Many 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 months ago Kuala Selangor is a pretty bad area no it's a pretty good area for the pandemic yeah okay firstly can we take like 10 minutes break i i would like to go straight into pile foundation but because this is now moving into a new topic so we better take like 10 minutes break is that okay with you guys or do you want me to just continue right because now we want to say to ourselves we are done with settlement, right? And then we will have to uh, do some homework. It will be quite a lot of homework, all right? 
So take about maybe 10 minutes, all right? Uh, break and then uh, we'll come back to go into uh, pile foundation. Okay? All right. Uh, okay. There is a class where you learn about stabilization. Otherwise, learn without it. Okay? Now, moving on. Uh, types of piles. The, the, sorry, the, the, the fourth and fifth. All right. Uh, uh, fourth and fourth. The, the, the part, not the part. Not. Number four, we won't be dealing with that much. Okay, you won't deal with that much because that's to do with slopes and, and, and uplift pressure. Uh, alluvial deposit containing water and hence soft soil, you basically has been introduced to uh, the idea of a soft material and what you need to do. All right. So, uh, except for the ground improvement, right, whether stabilization, lime stabilization or uh, any of the other uh, ground improvement methods you have not been told about that now moving on so types of pile general classification is into two types one is the end or tip bearing pile the other is friction pile this is uh general classification is what they say to you in industry all right this is the the simple idea of 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 uh, pile so I have one pile here with me right now, okay? And if I'm gonna put it in the ground, that's my pile, all right? So the soil is around the soil, uh, sorry, soil is around the pile, right? So it's gonna get the, if I put a load on top of my pile, right? That comes from the column. So my soil is going to resist that load, all right? So it's going to resist by one at the tip, at the tip here, all right? Tip has an area, you see, so it's going to resist at the tip. Also, because the soil is sticking to the, the, the pile, and then, you know, when you push it downward, it's going to go downward, so the soil is resisting it, and if the soil is resisting it around it, it's going to give you friction. So that's the other strength of the, the strength component Right, of the soil which resists the load or stress that you give in the pile. So that is why, okay, uh, in general uh, classification, they talk about tip or end bearing pile or they say about friction pile. Now, if more than 50% of the strength of the soil, right, that uh, resists the load that you give, right? The, the purpose of the pile is only to transmit the, the stresses or the load to the soil, right? It is again, I'm reminding you, the soil that is resisting the, the stresses or the load, whether you, it is shallow foundation or uh, deep foundation, okay? So, in more than 50% of the component from the tip end, all right? comes from the tip, then we call it an end bearing pile. Much of the strength comes from the tip of the uh, pile. If, however, more than 50% comes from the friction, so we call it friction pile, all right? All everything around it is friction. You know, 80% of say, of the bearing capacity of the soil, all right, is holding up your load, all right? So that's how you get your end or friction pile. So this is really giving you the idea that I'm getting my strength from the tip and from the uh, around the soil. All right. Um, otherwise, if you look into the standard, all right, it's on page three, page three A, right? BS eight thousand four code of practice for foundation, or figure eight point one seven grade is based on installation met methods, large or small displacement. Now, the top part of, of page 3A, all right, the top part of page 3A, all right, is just to give you an indication of the type of piles uh, available in, 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 in the field. In other words, how do they install this pile, all right, best a bearing 
on on the classification of the pile. So, for example, you see uh, the the one that says A precast reinforced concrete pile. All right, it says precast reinforced concrete pile. In other words, I have a pile that is made in a factory. All right, I I made it in a mold for a reinforcement and then. Uh, pour concrete in the reinforcement and then it comes out like that it comes out in that shape all right and at the top it is a, a well in this case it's almost a square all right so it says precast reinforced concrete pile so in that one it comes from the factory it goes to the side and then you just go and drive it bang it in bang 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 then it goes in all right in the second one uh, is steel edge pile. Uh, it's steel. It's made of steel, and then it's shaped uh, like an edge. All right. It's like your edge beam, steel beam. All right. So that one too, you drive it in. Okay, drive it in. And uh, C shell pile. Well, it has a, a, a steel steel tube, and then inside it you have a uh, concrete. All right. And then. Uh, Still, uh, for this one, you drive it into the ground. Okay. Now, in D, concrete pile cast as driven tube withdrawn. Imagine, like C, you have that tube. Okay, that tube, and it is first driven into the ground. Okay. Then you pour concrete into it. Then you take the, uh, you extract the the, the tube out. So. Concrete pile cast as driven tube is withdrawn. So you draw it out. Okay. That's how D is, is, is being obtained. Now uh, E. E is board pile cast in situ. Cast in situ means uh, you, you're going to cast it on site. There. All right. Cast it there on site in situ. So board pile cast in situ. Board means you bore a hole. Make a hole in the ground, boring, all right? Bore a hole in the ground. Then, uh, well, if you have reinforcement, you stick in reinforcement. If you don't have any reinforcement, you just stick in the concrete, all right? These days, you can have very high strength concrete, okay? So then you get your uh, board pile, which is cast in situ. And you can see that F sub S, which is the friction around the shaft of the pile and then q sub u which is the tip or end bearing uh ultimate bearing capacity at the tip of the pile okay and q sub f is the load that you apply so q sub f must be resisted by f sub s which is a stress multiplied by the surface area of the pile okay so first area of the friction part, you know, the friction loop, the friction here, see F sub S is along this, 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 uh, this part here. So you need to know the area of that surface area of that part, F sub S, and then, and then you have this one here, which is a tip. It's also a stress. Okay. It's a stress. And then you multiply it by the tip. Now I fix this. Ooh. Oh, sorry to the cancer. Okay. <laughs> I think do you have your brother with you or something? Playing with the food. Anyway. Load. This is stress. This is stress. So you need to multiply the you need to multiply by the surface area or the area of the tape. Uh Arman says you have a question. Yeah, please, uh Arman. What is the question? I'll wait for the question. Is there any lining before they pour the concrete into the hole? You are referring to E, Bot Pile Cast Institute? Yes. Nope. There is no lining before they pour the concrete into the hole. You are probably asking me whether when they dip the, <laughs> when they are boring the hole, all right, whether, whether the, you know, if it is in soft material, whether they can actually build that hole. Well, no, 
You see, so they in that one they brought the they they probably have uh, this uh, bentonite material whereby they strengthen the uh, the side of the wall. Okay, so it is a function of the type of the soil. Uh, the the to advance the hole itself is another science to it. All right. Okay, Arman. Okay, all right. You want to know more? You can read it in the in Greek, right? Okay. And then the the, the the final one is 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 a bell shape at the bottom. You see this one here? This is bell shape. And then everything else is, is essentially the same. Why do you have this bell shape? Because you want more of the bearing capacity. All right, the tip end, the end bearing. So you make a bell shape. And yes, you can make it bigger, you know, and then become smaller, and then it becomes smaller as you go up. The blade in relation to, uh, you know, constructing the hole. All right? Okay. Because I, I remember one year I had a student who cannot just cope with the, with the fact that how do you make a bigger one and then you have a smaller one? Well, I keep, I keep saying to, to him then that you can have the blade and then you can have a smaller diameter blade and you can have a smaller diameter blade that makes the hole. All right. And, 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 and you can retract the, the diameter of the, of the blade that makes the hole. I hope I'm making sense to you. Yeah. So what this picture tells you is that all right, I can make a lot of displacement by the way I install my pipe. If I'm going to drive it by banging it in, that's going to be a lot of displacement. Bang, bang, bang. There's going to be a lot of displacement. If I'm going to just have a hole in the ground, then I'm going to put concrete and reinforcement, you know, with or without, then I have very little displacement. Okay. So the bottom part is what the, the British Standard 8004 is saying to you about small displacement, large displacement, and you know, uh, no displacement, no displacement, small displacement, and large uh, displacement. If you can read that, all right, the types of part is say preform, uh, solid, or, or or something. I can't read that driven into the ground. Anything you drive is going to give you large displacement. Small displacement is going to give you small section, include edge pile, open-ended tube and a box pile, all right? unless a plug form during the driving. This no displacement, a void is formed by boring or excavation. The void is filled with concrete. So at one end, you have large displacement, which is to do with you drive the pile. Bang, 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 bang. Too much displacement. The other end is zero displacement, no displacement, they say. You make the hole first. Then you pour your concrete in. Obviously, there's nothing to, to, to it then, right? And in between, you have this uh, small displacement. Okay? This is just background knowledge. All right. If you read the book sometime or you read the code, sometimes they say this large displacement pile, small displacement pile, then uh, these are the numbers, then sometimes you don't know. So I'm giving you all of that in advance. Now, uh, general comments about pile, pile length in general are between 10 to 60 meters. All right. These days it can be like 200 meters even because uh, you know, technology has made it possible that you, you can have high strength concrete and all that. And then, uh, in general, right, the kind of, 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 of load that is taking can be 200 to even to 2,000 kilonewton now. Now, piles are less than one meter, okay? Generally speaking, if you have more than one meter, then they are called piers. They are not called piles, all right? The piers are what you find by the harbor, okay? The one that juts out. Uh, you know, you have jetties and all of that. Jet jetties are just uh, extended, um, extended platform where you can walk on the wood, you know, on the timber, and then you have these piers underneath it, and then uh, it, 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 it extends into the ground, and you call it, uh, you know, the 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 buried part is is called piers because they are usually more than one meter. All right, 
and you, if you see some of those structures where uh, it's shallow, right? Let's say those uh, oil and gas structures, yeah, right? Oil and gas structures, uh, not too far out in the middle of the sea. They they have also uh, piers, all right? Uh, okay, that's basically uh, what you need to know about piles in general. So, uh, two things when it comes to foundation. All right. The other one is just to do with respect with the material itself. All right. But in general, bearing capacity, settlement. So now we are going into the bearing capacity of a single pile. One pile. Note that piles sometimes they exist uh, in groups. All right. You can have one, two piles, you know, uh, two piles like that. And then you have a pile cap on top of it, which is a, just a concrete. Uh, square which which encompasses the the, uh, the the group pile, so the load is being applied uh, equally to the two piles. Okay, so today we are going to start with a bearing capacity of single pile. Um, the methods of assessment, whereas in the shallow footing, which we said to ourselves, we're just going to use the field method, all right, or we're just going to do some formulas, all right. Uh, here you you also you have three methods all right one is the pilot test the second one is the static formula that's the theory the static formula the third one is dynamic formula the dynamic formula is because we said to ourselves we, we, we're going to drive the pile in bang 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 so we're going to give some dynamic energy to the pile and we're going to you know derive formulas if it is possible to do that all right why do we need to do that? Because you know, since we 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 since we're going to drive it, if we can make an equation that says that what I give in terms of the uh, in terms of the energy to the pile, okay, I can make a formula out of that. And then I can check on my static formula, and if I were to have this pile load test, then I can have all three methods all at the same time. Okay, so most of the time we tend to use the static formula all right the static formula because uh it's reliable partly but it is also because um it's cheaper all right uh, the pile load test if we say we drive in a hundred piles in then most of the time we are going to just do say one percent of the piles. In other words, only one out of that 100, we're going to have a pile load test. So you can imagine, uh, you know, that's not much, right? So why do we do it? We do it because we want to confirm that our static formula, which is a function of C and T, right, is reliable, all right? That it is, uh, it can confirm what uh, our prediction in terms of the static formulas are now maximum usually we do three piles but generally just one pile all right so anything that we do on the field is basically very expensive now remember a few minutes ago when we, we were talking about settlement in shallow footing all right in shallow foundation i mentioned to you about the pile load uh, about the plate load test well, that's the same test as the as the pile test. I said, don't get confused. I said to you earlier on, do not get confused between the two. One, I have a plate. Now I'm going to have a pile. Okay. So I'll start with that. And if you look at the bottom of that, that, that page three, you see the picture. I have a pile. I have a hydraulic jack, hydraulic jack, and at the corners of the pile. All right. If I have a square pile, at the corners of the pile, I have the uh, a dial gauge diametrically opposite, all right, diametrically opposite, and then I have the cant lash. The cant lash can be an H or I steel beam, and then I have the concrete blocks, usually one meter width, uh, one meter deep, and one meter length. So you have one meter cube concrete, and if the density or rather the unit weight of concrete is what 24 kilonewton per meter cube so one meter one cube of that concrete block one by one by one is 24 kilonewton all right so that's why they are one meter one meter one meter 
all those uh, concrete blocks. Now you have to imagine that this concrete block are being carried by cranes. All right, you have to put it on top. Okay, and then you put another one on top, you load it, and then you're going to unload it, and then you're going to measure the settlement. The settlement is measured by the dial gauge. Okay, measured by the dial gauge. So, uh, I don't seem to have any pictures here, right? Okay. Uh, let me read here what you say. So, full size pile representing working or actual piles. So, now you're trying to, uh, this is an actual pile which you are going to found uh, to support your, 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 your structures, your superstructures. All right. You're going to install it in the ground. Then you load it via hydraulic jack. Reaction from the jack is supplied via the cantilever supported by frames. Okay, so if you look on page three hundred and forty-one on in Craig, all right, page three hundred and forty-one in Craig. I'm sure you have that. Okay, here page three hundred and forty-one. This picture here. Okay, you have that with you now. So put it on the side because I'm going to use that now. Uh, there are two types of tests which you apply for that setup just now. One is the MLT, the maintain load test. You load is applied for every increment, and then you can get the load settlement time curves are obtained. Then this is reliable for settlement estimate. So if I look at that uh, figure 8.21 on page 342, I see in A, all right? The maintain load test is in A. So I have, I put the load on the cat lash, right, the concrete block. I let it be. I allow for a certain period of time. And then I come back again after that time and I load it again. And so I always have this constant load for some period of time. So you see that increment of steps in, in, uh, in, in the picture here, see? Increment of step constant. So that's what is meant by maintain load. All right. So that's just load again time. And the dial gauges at the corner, the dial gauges at the corner, all right, are going to measure my settlement. So these gauges, all right, will give me the settlement. Yeah. So I can have uh, in the same picture in the maintain load test, I have the settlement against time. Then I can obviously load, uh, draw that load against settlement. All right. So as I'm increasing, as I'm increasing, I get this uh, hyperbolic shape, right? Then I, you know, my earlier picture shows you the concrete blocks, right? This concrete block, right? The concrete block. Okay, I am loading. Now I can remove the concrete block and therefore I am unloading. See here, I am unloading here. Right? The bottom here, I am unloading. And uh, soil is not elastic. It doesn't come back to its original uh, point. Okay, so that is the settlement against load. So in the maintain load test. All right? Now, it's very good at determining the settlement, okay? So I can do load, I can do unload, all right? And then I can find out the settlement. And I can draw this load settlement time curve, no big deal. The other one is the opposite of what I have. Instead of uh, having a maintained load, I'm going to have the penetration, which is uh, constant. So the pile is jacked into the ground, at a constant rate. So I'm going to push it in at a constant rate. And then what the value in terms of the load, the continuous load is recorded. It's a bit difficult to, to imagine, but you know, it's just the opposite of the maintained load test. So uh, what we need to realize is that tests are expensive. It should be considered for large projects only when you're doing this uh, Load test. Obviously, like I said, if you have a 100 pile, you tend to test only one or three percent. Okay, but uh, the results are not necessary. Collect as many uh, interpretations are available. But there has been this. This there are many interpretations uh, available. It's a function 
if if everything is is correct in other words you did the test correct and then your pile is not cracked or it, it, you know when you are driving the pile it is not uh, you know it doesn't break right the, the stresses uh, you apply to the pile it, it's not broken the pile is not broken so you will get a uh, uh, pretty pretty easy interpretation so in the uh, second part in the constant uh, in, i'm looking at this picture not page 342 all right in b is a constant rate of penetration test all right so uh, the constant rate of penetration test uh, will give you load against penetration. Load against penetration is also load against settlement, if you like. Right? That's the constant rate of penetration test. So the curves for A and B, all right, in you know big A and big B, I have here, you know, yeah, I have here A, B, and then this is the constant rate penetration test. All right. The curve for that uh, A and B which is pretty defined. Those are for friction piles, all right? You remember that uh, a few minutes ago, I talked about friction piles, whereby the, the, the ultimate bearing capacity of the pile, if you like, all right? It's a function of the friction or, uh, of the soil uh, around the pile when you load the, 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 the pile, okay? And C is... Uh, and bearing piles, right? If you get uh, the tip, if you get much of the bearing capacity from the tip, from the tip of the pile, then uh, you get, you tend to get the curve C. Now, curve A and B is very easy, right? It reaches a maximum value and it's A, for example, it reaches a maximum value and then it starts to come down. So you know what the ultimate load is, right? And the same with B, it reaches a maximum, uh, sorry, in, in B, it reaches a maximum value, but uh, the penetration keeps going. So that is a problem. Okay, in B, it can be a problem because, um, uh, well, you know, it, 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 you, you just say to yourself, B is not really a problem because it reaches a maximum value and then, then, then it is just like, it gives right the settlement keep increasing right so you say to yourself well the maximum value is like the peak where it reaches right so both of that is quite well defined in terms of the ultimate value of the bearing capacity of the soil but the type that you get in c all right where the load never actually reaches a constant value. It keeps, you know, increasing, increasing, and then it decreases, decreases, decreases. It's never a constant value, all right? And it, it decreases, but it, it, it never stops. So C never stops. So in that one, that is a problem. So the code tend to, to, to say that the load, the bearing, the ultimate value of the, of the for the bearing capacity, is uh, where you get 10% uh, of the diameter of the pile occurring in terms of the settlement. So if the penetration is 10% of the uh, diameter of the pile, that's the load that you should take uh, to be equivalent as the ultimate value. All right. Okay, moving on. Now, those are, I'm done with the pile load test. Okay, the second thing to look at today is the static formula. The last thing is um, dynamic formula. I think in the dynamic formula, well, I hope we can finish that today. No, maybe. Maybe we'll do the dynamic formula next week. All right, I think. So the second method of assessing bearing capacity is through static formula. All right. Now, my pile here is circular in shape. But a few minutes ago, I showed to you that picture, All right? This picture here. Okay. It can be square in shape. It can have edge shape. It can even have annular shape. Well, not no annular shape here. It can have one of this which is bigger and smaller. 
All right, no annular shape. So I can have square, I can have A shape, I can have many different shapes. Yeah? All right, I can have many different shapes. So why am I referring to that picture? Because I'm on this page now on static formula. All right? So the ultimate load in that equation, with equation one, it says Q out. This is a load which is a force, right? Q out, it's a force. Ultimate load in kilonewton or newton is equal to pi BD multiplied by F sub S plus A T multiplied by Q sub U. Remember just now I said when I showed you that picture where the skin friction is F sub S and I said to you where the Q sub U is. All right, the Q sub U is the ultimate bearing capacity if it is circular in shape, if it is square in shape. You learn that in shallow footing. Then for the second component, Q sub U multiplied by A tip. And then I talked to you about the shaft skin friction then a few minutes ago, right? When I was going through to you with you the different types of power, the shaft skin friction. And I said to you that, that, that F sub S must multiply by the area of the pile. Okay, the surface area of the pile. So I want you to write on that equation, Q out equal to area of shaft, A sub S multiplied by F sub S plus A tip multiplied by Q sub U. Can you do that now? Because that equation that I write, uh, that is written there, pi B multiplied by D is for a shape like this. There. This shape. If it is square, it's not going to be pi b multiplied by d, is it? Hello, guys, are you awake? <laughs> Hello, guys, are you awake? If you're not awake, I'm going to go, okay. All right. I didn't say yes. So, Q out equal to F sub S multiplied by A sub S plus A sub T multiplied by Q sub U. Okay? Then that equation one says this is for a cylindrical shape. You know, uh, 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 you know the tip is, is, is circular, circular and then it is uh, the shaft is cylindric, cylindrical like this. Okay? Why do I say this? Because that A sub S is a function of the shape of the pile. All right. If I don't say it to you, then you know people uh, take this formula as the overriding formula, even though when it is a square. So that cannot be right. All right. Uh, I assume when I wrote this formula, you know because I've already explained to you the different shape of the paths and everything, you'll be uh, smart enough and intelligent enough to make the difference. Right? But it appears that <laughs> as a student, sometimes we don't, uh, we don't think right? for some reason or another. We just take it for what it is. So somebody has to point it out to us, then, then we, we put it in our help. Okay. Okay. Now, here's the the schematics, right? The schematics and how the skin friction and the uh, tip resistance acts. All right. So in the first one, the picture that Q out, you know, Q out is the actually comes from the soil, but that's the amount of uh, you know what that's going to be equal to the, to the maximum load that the, a column can take, right? So that's why I'm putting it up there, Q out, okay? Uh, sometimes that is confusing to, to a student, right? But you can say to yourself, Q out is equal to the column load. The column load is going to be equal to the, to the, to the load that the soil can give, all right? So that's the maximum value. And then it is uh, at depth D, the, 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 the pile is going to be embedded in the soil, all right, at depth D, whether it's going to be driven or it's going to be precast on site, all right, board pile, and it has a diameter B, all right, diameter is B, 
Okay, so it's cylindrical in shape. Now, in the second one, in the second, uh, in the middle, the diagram in the middle is the variation of the uh, end bearing capacity, right? And also the skin tension along the shaft of the bar. So the end bearing capacity at the tip is going to be a constant value because it's, it's at some depth there, some depth here, which is a function of the shear strength of the soil and the feet, okay, uh, of the soil. And then it is only at that depth and you just multiply by the area, which is constant. So Q sub U is always constant there, all right? And then you notice the skin friction for the cohesive soil. It, uh, you know, is somewhat, it's, it's linearly decreasing, all right? The, the shape is decreasing. I mean, the line is decreasing to the depth Z, all right? But, you know, as you go down, okay, it is, the friction is decreasing, but the sum total of the friction, because the area of the shaft area is increasing as you go to the depth Z. So the skin friction is increasing with depth Z, all right? That's linearly variable, but in the last of the, the diagram, it shows the, for the cohesionless soil, which is not linearly distributed. In fact, it is a curve, okay? The this, this skin friction. Now, uh, so our problem then is, um, let me get a piece of paper, all right? And if I were to write that down, again, just now, okay? Q sub L is equal to A sub S times F sub S plus A sub T multiply by Q sub U. This is the equation, right? Okay? This is the equation. All right? So our problem then is to find this. A sub T is a constant. Q sub U is a constant. See this? Q sub U is the constant, A sub T is a constant, if F sub S is our problem, A sub S is actually a constant. All right? So my problem now is to determine this. If I can determine this in cohesionless soil, F sub S, then my problem is solved because I can get everything else. All right? So, why am I showing to you this? I'm showing to you this because by the time you get through up to page, uh, <laughs> up to page, uh, you know, nine, you have lost uh, the reason why we are talking about all these formulas. But remember, all you want to do is find F sub S to stick it into this equation for the two different types of soil, clay and sand, and then I can get you out. Okay? So, with that purpose, um, the F sub S, all right, I'm now looking at this load distribution for friction piles. So F sub S not necessarily constant for the above case. You need to integrate over the embedded depth. Okay, that I already explained to you. Because they are not constant, then you, you know, the surface area is increasing with depth. And then, um, you know, in the cohesionless soil, is, is a curve. So you need to actually integrate over the whole area with respect to that. But, uh, you know, for, for the Q sub U, it's easy. All right? Let's look at the constant for Q sub U first. So for a circular pile from uh, bearing capacity, right? If you use the Zagi, then Q sub U is equal to 1.2 C C N C plus uh, Q N Q Q being gamma Z multiplied by N sub Q plus 0.6, right? Gamma R N gamma because it's circular. If it is a square, then you know everything else remains the same. 
the same. The first term is the same. The second term is the same. The third term is 0.4 multiplied by B and gamma. You have done all this homework. You should know this by now. So basically, I said Q sub U, whatever shape it comes in, H file, for example, you must know that Q sub U by now, right? If you don't know the Q sub U, then perhaps it's time for you to know. What am I talking about? Here, yeah, this one. Uh, okay. This is easy for a square. You can use the Zagi or you can use Kempton or whatever you want to use. All right? All of this. Circle and squares are easy because you have been given the formula. Now I'm asking you, if you are given this H file, what is Q sub U? It's easy. But for some of you who likes to memorize, then they have problem. You see, they, they, they see it the first time, they don't know how to do it. Because I have a few of you who do not understand principle of superposition for some reason or another. As far as I'm concerned, this all right, is a square minus some things which throw it away, which you throw away from the square and become a shape. So I can use principle of superposition to find my Q sub U. If you don't know what I'm saying, go start learning about it. A shape, I shape. Are we okay, guys? I'll wait for you to say I'm awake. <laughs> yes? Okay. I says okay. Awake. All right. Yeah? So sometimes I have to point to you all this thing because, you know, you, you just like take for granted. The purpose of giving you homework is to make you aware of certain things. All right? So, now, uh, like I said, you cannot forget your site investigation. You cannot forget your brain capacity. And now, you cannot forget your settlement because they are all interrelated. Even in past, you have to depend on, on some of those things we learned in the shallow footing. All right. So, as shown above for cohesionless soil, I'm on page 6. The load does not reduce linearly with depth. I already said that to you. Then the skin friction is not constant over depth D, but increases with increasing depth. For any depth Z in cohesionless soil, the skin friction is equal to sigma H tangent delta. Now, if I were to draw my pile, okay, here's a, a pile and an element of soil just adjacent to my pile. Element of soil adjacent to my pile. You see that? So, this skin friction is F sub S in that direction. That is equal to, this is sigma V, this is sigma H. Sigma H. Okay. That element of soil will have sigma V, sigma H in that direction as shown. Sigma H is the one that has uh, delta in it. F sub S is sigma V related to sigma H. Okay. Now, uh, the sigma V and sigma H is uh, related to each other by some coefficient. You remember we said this uh, some while back when we were talking about the, uh, I believe, the constellation of clay. You know, when we were trying to find the, uh, the Scanton uh, bearer method of, of, of settlement. All right? And then we repeat this, 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 this understanding in, uh, in the stress path method. When we say that we notice there is this thing called the k naught line, and I explained to you that sigma v over sigma h is equal to k naught, and that's equal to the coefficient of earth pressure at rest. And then I, in fact, explain to you that you learn about the active and passive pressure. Some while back, I explained this to you, right? The active pressure being the uh, sigma d over sigma h, 
and then the passive pressure being the opposite, sigma H over sigma V, you have a failure through uh, yielding and failure through compression. Yes? So anyway, if you, have, <laughs> if you have forgotten all of that, that's why you get now the skin picture, sigma H tangent delta. You can change sigma H to sigma V, all right? That tangent delta because there is a friction, so it is uh, truncated at some angle. And then uh, sigma V is just gamma multiplied by Z, all right? That K tangent delta. So sigma V is my vertical horizontal delta is the friction angle for pi surface. K is a pressure coefficient. Now that delta I need to explain to you. That delta is equivalent to phi. Now if you recall in your bearing capacity, we said to you, uh, we said to ourselves, we'll do modifications on a general shear failure. You know, from the general shear failure, the shape we took was initially a strip, and then we say it could be a circle, it could be a a square and what we needed to do to do all that modification and then in the end finally we said to ourselves okay that is just you know all these equations that we produce and we are using all right uh, uh, for general shear failure it could well be that we have punching shear and also uh, the other shear failure apart from uh, general shear failure all right uh, what's the other one the punching shear or oh, I'm a bit tired now uh, we have general shear failure, we have punching shear, and we have another failure, all right? So then we said to observe that the phi for uh, the phi and the C for non-general shear failure, all right, is uh, two-thirds of phi. You know, C is equal to, sorry, C is two-thirds of phi, and tangent phi is equal to two-thirds of tangent of delta. You remember that? So this is the same... Uh, situation so the delta here is not equal to phi it's equal to two-thirds of phi if you like all right it's the friction angle between the pile and the soil okay so just to remind you that these are all these modifications that we made all right so my problem then if i can find what k is and what tangent delta is i can get my f sub s if i can get my f sub s i can multiply by a I can multiply by A sub S, I can solve all this problem. Then I get my ultimate bearing capacity. Remember, I said to you, all these things that come after this is because I don't know what F sub S is. So that's all this uh, set of notes is trying to say to me. Yeah. So K tangent delta, if I have my pile in loose sand, is equal to 0.25. All right. These are all the research that is being done and the numbers that they get. If I have my pile in dense end, k tangent delta equals to 1. So if I can stick into that equation, I can get f sub s. If I can get f sub s, I multiply a sub s, I get the skin friction. All right? Okay. Uh, otherwise, what you only say this delta varies between 0.5 p prime for smooth steel pile in sand that is dry to phi prime for concrete pile in dry sand. All right? Okay, next week. What Kazagi and uh, Peck said, you know, F sub S, if I have a long pile in a loose sand, if the pile is long, all right, just take F sub S to be 25. So any of these, you know, pointers, any of these recommendations I can use, all right? So uh, if it is short pile in dense sand, it's 100 kilopascal. So by definition, long and short has a definition which I haven't given uh, to you here. And it's not important if it is uh, in, a, in a test or an exam, I'll tell you, take this value, all right? And consider it to be a long or short pile because long and short pile has a theory in itself, which we won't go dwell in, in, in this course, all right? So, parts in soil with friction and cohesion. Okay, the skin friction, or if you have friction and cohesion, C and P soil, then you have the skin friction is due to the adhesion, C sub A, and then you have sigma H tangent delta. That sigma H tangent delta is a few minutes ago. It is because of the friction. Now, you know, the, 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 the delta is equivalent to the P. Now, you have cohesion, 
C sub U normally is C sub U or C is normally what you see. So now we have another term we call adhesion, C sub A. C sub A is like C sub U. All right? So uh, in piles, this uh, C sub A is called an adhesion factor and it is modified from the undrained position, C sub U. All right, if P sub U equals to zero, then you have the skin friction F sub S equal to C sub A. Why? Delta is also equals to zero. Delta is related to phi. Now phi is equal to zero, so tangent delta is zero, so the component sigma H tangent delta is zero, so the F sub S, the skin friction is equal to C sub A. All right? So we can thus obtain empirical relation of average C sub U at depth at which pile is installed. Now, C sub A is equal to alpha C sub U. In other words, alpha, the ratio alpha is equal to C sub A over C sub U, right? Somewhere beside it. Alpha equals to C sub A over C sub U. All right, so this alpha, it depends on type of clay, you know, whether it's soft clay, stiff clay, right? Uh, pile installation method, whether you have small displacement, large displacement, whether you drive it or whether you have it cast in situ, board pile, okay? And then what type of pile is it? Is it timber? Is it steel? Is it concrete? All right, so... Here's one example of the relationship between alpha and the uh, C sub U, the undrained shear strength, all right? So at the bottom there of this uh, diagram, you see very soft, soft, medium, stiff, stiff, very stiff. That should remind you in site investigation, all right? You define the undrained shear strength, all right? Sorry, you define the clay, in relation to the undrained shear strength values that you find on site. So, for example, very soft is between 0 and 250 pounds per square feet. All right, and the y axis on the horizontal axis is pounds per square feet. It is not an arbitrary correlation. So, sometimes when you see questions that are say, uh, that says that, uh, you know, a clay is found to be very stiff you know, having uh, an undrained position of some values. They are actually, right, following those uh, classification which you made in site investigation and which you earlier made in Soil Mechanics 1. All right, so you have those two curves, average curve for concrete paths and the average curve for all paths. Ratio C sub A over C sub U is equal to alpha. All right, alpha is equal to the adhesion over the unrain position. Now, as you can see, I'm like, you know, three to four times repeating some of this word. Why do I say this? Because I have some students, right, in the final exams ask me, what is addition? Where do you get the alpha from? I'm like, <laughs> you know, I gave you homework for doing this. What were you doing with the homework? You know, so I'm warning you about all of this thing. Okay. Now, uh, the other methods to obtain the, the skin friction for clay, you, you find it in the tables below, right? I'm already on the next page. The table below, right? A concrete and timber paths. Then, then you have soft, firm, and stiff. Again, those are definitions, all right? If C sub U between 0 to 36 a kilopascal, then in the clay is soft, all right? So the adhesion varies between 0 to 34. So you have this type of piles, right? And again, uh, where they occur, in what type of soil, right? Soft, firm, or stiff. And then uh, what type of file piles that you use, you know, steel piles have different value of adhesion uh, from uh, concrete pile in, say, the same type of uh, clay soil. So I'm giving you all these formulas. All right, and all these theories. And all I'm saying to you is that, you know, you have a pile. If it is in sand, you have the adhesion and the uh, friction. If it is in clay only, you only going to have the adhesion value. In other words, the cohesion. All right, cohesion at the tip, and then you have adhesion around the shaft. If it is in sand, you have the tip value, 
all right, which is the end resistance, and then you have full friction if it is zero uh, cohesion, okay? And then those things uh, that I just mentioned to you, all this value, K tangent delta and whatnot, and tables how to get these values to stick it into the QR equation equals to AS multiplied by AF F sub S multiplied by A T multiplied by Q sub U. And then we'll review this example 8.7 to 8.10 next week when I come back to see you, inshallah, if I'm still alive. Okay. And then 10, and then we'll talk about uh, perhaps uh, we'll finish about the example and then the uh, bearing capacity of passing groups. And then we'll talk about settlement and negative skin friction and the last part in a 14 week or earlier. Okay. I want to stop there, guys. It's 4.30 today. I could have gone through the example today, but I think, uh, you know, it's always better to give you the theory and then to come back again uh, next week and to go through the example and remind you on those theories and how to apply those theories in, in the example. Okay, guys? Azli says, okay. All right. And uh, give me, uh, keep me, Okay, Nadia says, okay, I will give the, the homework to Shakila and hopefully she will viral it. It's going to be quite a lot. All right. So you have one week to do it <laughs> for the settlement. All right. Muhammad Nur Hafizi says, homework not okay. You don't learn anything if you don't do homework, Hafizi. You see? How do you, how do you learn? You see, I could be talking to you like, you know, from morning to afternoon. Then I say, uh, you know, do you understand? And you say to me, yes. If you understand, I say, you know, then I have to give you homework. Then you show to me whether you understand. Yes or no, obviously. Hello, obviously. Obviously doesn't have anything to say to me. He says homework not okay. <laughs> I know you're joking. That's why I have to, to you know, to have to, to, to argue with you, right? You know, I mean, obviously, you know, I'm just joking, yeah. But I'm going to say it anyway, right? You see, even God gave me homework. You notice that? I know. I say to God, uh, whoever did I do? I'm just, just, just making an argument with RPG, right? You know, even God, I say to him, look, I believe you. I'm having, you know, I, I believe you, I'm okay, I, you know, I accept you and everything. But he says, I give you homework. You know, you go pray, you go do good stuff, you know, you be nice to other people. Yeah? Why does he have to give me homework? <laughs> Can you explain to me, Abdi, why he has to give me homework? You just say yes. <laughs> You see, you have an answer? Why does he have to give me homework? Now, RPG doesn't have an answer. Supaya kita sentiasa di jalan yang benar, and he says to me, I'm, I'm already jalan, I'm already on the straight path. You know, why do you have to give me homework? <laughs> and sometimes, Amy, because he gives me homework, I am no longer on the straight path. I am on the wrong path. <laughs> Practice makes you perfect. Amy says so. Wow. So I give you a lot of homework, then you cannot, then you cannot, uh, you cannot argue against me, right? I can give you one hundred homework because it makes you perfect. Afizi says, "Supaya kita selalu ingat Tuhan." I already had. You know. <laughs> hey guys, do you have anything to say? You know fully well that they are perhaps uh, refining the SOP for the online exam, right? And the heck with it, right? Adoy, adoy, apa Amy? Lim, are you there, Lim? I, Lim is always quiet, right? Is his name Lim? 
Ya, Lim Chi Yuan. Lim. Have you gone to, uh, yes? Okay, you are here. You are okay, ya, Lim? Yes, okay. All right, fine. Okay. And then So is also here, right? So, are you okay? You're very quiet, these two. Even in class, when I see you in class, you're very quiet. Whose birthday is today, Aida? Aida Papa, sir. Whose birthday? Amy Kelvin. Kelvin, who is Kelvin? Kelvin Lim. Rohima and Lim. Wow. Happy birthday to you then. Uh, so how are you going to celebrate? Virtually. Uh, are you going to celebrate everyone who is going to wish a limb by on 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 virtually? Huh? Oh yeah, I don't know. Sadi foundation to celebrate. Ha ha ha. <laughs> you know, lame people like me don't don't celebrate birthday. You know why? Because when you celebrate birthday every day, you, every year, you know that you are getting older. Unless they can come up with a way that, that make me every every year younger, I'm happier to celebrate birthday. Isn't it true? You know, when you're you're perhaps like you know 18, maybe you want to be 21. See, exam says now true. Basli uh, says uh, happy birthday. <laughs> you see, but every year. After 21, you're getting older. I say, baik, say muda lagi. When you are 18, that's the, you know, if you read up about science, 18, when you pass 18, all your body is starting to give way. You are getting older. You know, the peak is when you are 18. If you are like now 20 something, you're getting old already. No point. <laughs> It's just a matter of time. Isa, do you know that? See? What knowledge does to you? If you have knowledge, you wouldn't say all those things. 